welcome to the Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera, where our mission is to share the fun of the big questions with you. My name is Dr. Kim Diaz, and I teach philosophy at El Paso Community College. And my name is Jules Simon. I teach philosophy at University of Texas, El Paso. For our first guest, we are honored to have Dr. Juan Ferret. Dr. Ferret received his PhD in philosophy at the University of Oregon. He also holds degrees in mathematics and physics from Gonzaga University. He is the founder and executive director of the Philosophic Systems Institute, SCI, which is a community nonprofit organization that aims to introduce art, logic, scientific reasoning, and interdisciplinary critical inquiry in our community in a systematic and effective way. Dr. Ferret's projects have included federal reentry and diversion programs that offer higher learning, mindfulness, improved expression skills, and deep reflection for returning citizens. Also, uh, K through 12 educational projects that include a NASA sponsored stream curriculum uh, called Pick and Learn, which is based on deeply engaging scientific narratives. Also the active learning through the fine arts program in collaboration with the El Paso Community Foundation. Dr. Ferret's philosophy is very engaged and he has been the recipient of numerous grants, including from agencies such as NASA, the Andrew Mellon Foundation. He also oversees federal contracts working for the U.S. Department of Justice and works closely with local schools, museums, and community organizations. Some of his publications include The Flow of Nectar and Blood, Maya Philosophy and World Vision, Foundations of Philosophy of Physics, Analysis of Information and Computation in Physics Explains Cognitive Paradigms, from full cognition to Laplace determinism to statistical determinism to modern approach. The Power of Flowers, the philosophy of organism of the Maya. What energy is it? The meaning of energy in classical and quantum mechanics. Dr. Ferret has presented his work in venues all over the world, including numerous places within the US and Mexico, France, Canada, Italy, Spain, Hawaii, and India. He is originally from Catalonia, but has been living in the U.S. since high school and in El Paso for 20 some years. Is that right, Dr. Ferret? That's right. Did we miss anything? That was, yeah, very kind and very, very well done. Thank you. What an impressive amount of work you've done. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I, I can, as you were going through it, I, I recognize that one of the, the things that uh, when you hear others tell you or tell others about your work is how many people have always been involved, you know, and connected with the work, including some of the publications, but most importantly, the works in action, bringing philosophy to, to El Paso has been a deeply collaborative effort. And I think that's one of the things I'm happiest about is bringing this collective effort uh, into being, so to speak. And I think it's true for many of us. It's just sometimes we forget, right? But yeah, I'm very happy about, about that. This first question is, is very general. It could be about everything or about something very specific. What is philosophy? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's supposed to be simple for us who do philosophy for a living, right? But ends up being the core, once again, um, of the discipline, the, the returning question. And for me, I, I, I already mentioned the collective. I think that um, philosophy is always done in the collective, but I think that we've missed out some important parts of doing philosophy collectively. And maybe later I'll talk a bit about it some more, maybe in terms of our programs. But to me, philosophy is a collective act and a collective act that requires a lot of support for taking experiences that we have in the everyday and be able to pause and really reflect on them and be able to build from them, be able to take deep questions from those experiences, which can be going to a museum and seeing a work of art, or it can be that I was cooking dinner and something fell into my plate and it tasted delicious. And you wonder what happened aesthetically and also what happened to me as a, as a cook or as a chef, right? So 
that opening up to me is the beginning of the philosophical journey. And philosophy for me is never a complete task, but an ongoing dynamic collective effort based on our experiences that hopefully it can weave together into deep and rich uh, creation of systems. Uh, that's a little bit out there, but the creation of really powerful systems that engender further collective inquiry as in the way that the way that science for instance has proceeded or philosophy itself has proceeded, but do it in a way that it, the collective is not just a few of us, but more of us. How did you come to philosophy? Well, I have a funny story about that. I went to a very religious school in Spain, which I didn't do very well in that setting at the time. And I had a, um, my sophomore year there, there was a teacher who was not fully there. In fact, two years later, he was institutionalized by not fully there. <laughs> but he came in the first day of class. He sat on his desk in front of about 30 students we were a very rowdy class and he didn't say a word for 40 minutes and then class was over. I don't know if he did it on purpose. Uh, the second class he came back, he had us all freaked out. Then he had a, def a definition for us, a sheet of paper with uh, Aristotle's concept of substance. And he gave that to us and said, read it and tell me what you think. And it was incomprehensible to most of us. But I, I thought it was amazing. And I couldn't even tell you why, but just seeing those words in the page that were hard to understand, but I could sense they were probing into something deep. It had me hooked. And it was only months later that it was clear to me that there was no other path for me that to be a philosopher, to enter into the world of philosophy. And I'm still on that journey. I think I like the idea of coming to class and not saying anything <laughs> personally. Uh -huh. It was amazing. <laughs> that, would, that would be tough to do for, I think, for any one of us. <laughs> so the next, the next question, uh, couple, next couple questions are, are, you know, tied up with this first one, right? You know, is one born a philosopher? Is one naturally a philosopher or does, do we become, or does one become a philosopher? Yeah, good, good question. I, I usually don't entertain those questions for too long, but there, I recognize that they're good questions. I might not have very good answers for them. For me, I, I think it was more like the experiences I had. I don't think I was born in a different setting. I don't know if I would have been a philosopher, but given what I was facing, a fairly conservative household in a fairly conservative uh, part of the community, I didn't have access to those outlets, and I felt something pressing against me something that I needed liberation and a philosophy was that path toward liberation. Maybe in a different setting, I would have been more, more political already or, or somebody else. So I don't feel like I had to be a philosopher, but given my experiences and my context, it really shaped me. So I don't think I can say it was destiny and plus I don't think about that being metaphysically really possible. There's no such thing for me, but so experientially, uh, given where I grew up, I definitely felt that probably as I was bound to be a philosopher, but no, I wasn't born one, or maybe none of us are born one, but, but maybe somebody else could be that no matter what the circumstance, they would have been a philosopher then, and maybe some cases are of that, but I think most of us are, the experiences really do shape us uh, powerfully. Yeah, just as an aside, there's a very famous philosopher who said that uh, humans, some humans are born with gold in their blood, some with lead, you know, some, some people yeah. are born with brains to think and others are born with, you know, stones <laughs> in their head, stones for brains. That was Plato, by the way. <laughs> right. um, I want to, I would like to ask you, in your opinion, what makes a philosopher? You know, part of what philosophy is, is the fight of who is a philosopher. This groups of philosophers, the fight over who is a worthwhile philosopher, who isn't, you know, and sometimes they go to the extent of denying some large schools of thought or philosophers as being such. And, and to me, I really extend, uh, which is seen as a diluting the concept of philosophy, but I really like to extend those concepts, not to dilute them, but to really encompass the possibilities. 
and then to really work through more in context to figure out who did what kind of philosophy. So to me, anybody who's engaged in this act of taking experience seriously, which can be heavily abstracted. Some philosophers like Plato, you know, heavily abstracted, not too much time for the everyday experience maybe, um, which I think he spent quite a bit of time with his daily experience, you know, his relations with Socrates and, and so forth. But I feel that those who take experience as a platform from further inquiry, they can be philosophers. And for instance, um, um, the now referred to as a scientist, which is not a word that existed before, but Isaac Newton referred to as a natural philosopher who spent quite a bit of time um, trying to figure out alchemy, but spent about 10 years trying to figure out what was the power of the laws of the universe. And so his experience, you know, there's the anecdote of the apple falling with his head, which is probably apocryphal, but from his experience, trying to connect um, the basics of relations of motion in the everyday to the one of the stars. Uh, again, collectively with a great benefit of his teachers, of the work of um, Copernicus before, and of course, Galileo. And so in that collective, taking the experiences um, seriously and wanting to probe deeper makes him a philosopher. So any scientist would be one, anybody who's in, in the process of wanting to find themselves in a deeper way can be in the beginning of making themselves a philosopher. Of course, you know, if they say that and then they say, well, I'm a professional philosopher, that's different. You know, a professional philosopher we did nowadays would be somebody who is really invested in that work and probably gets paid for that work. So um, we can make distinctions in the right scope to say, everyone has the possibility of being a philosopher and some can really rise quickly. And then maybe very few can make a living out of the philosophical world without contradiction to say that there's a narrow pathway to professional philosophers, which I frankly love to expand. And there's a really broad view of who can be engaged in the philosophical act. And so I, I live with there, but I think part of my work, uh, especially in the last 15 years has been to not only say that we can do this, but really cultivate the grounds for having many more of us be engaged in the philosophical act, expanding that collective. I would like to follow up with these two questions. Who does yep. philosophy and who can do philosophy? Yes, uh, that's tricky. Uh, good question. It's actually related to what you were just talking about, right? You know, I know, three... it's getting into the weeds, right? Yeah. Um, Yes, thank you for that. And and in a way, I, I, I hope that feel free to throw stuff at me if you don't like it, uh, as part of this tertulia of this conversation, because that's how I remember watching TV years ago and in Spanish TV when there were two channels, one of the channels uh, that, I, that I mentioned was more intellectual, the other one was more for enjoyment. But I didn't understand when I was a kid watching this channel and these conversations, but they would always be yelling at each other. So maybe you don't have to yell at me, but so feel free to interject. But I think any, anybody that does, because we can say I'm a philosopher, but then you can say, well, what do you do? Well, I write books. Well, how is your book coming along? Well, I've been writing it for the last 20 years. Is that, if the book doesn't get finished, what well, happened to the last 20 years? So I think anybody who's in the act of working towards something, even if it doesn't get finished, is doing philosophy. If they're in the process, like I said earlier, of digging deep into the experiences and providing, at the same time, I would say digging deep um, in the question of who really does philosophy or who has the capacity to do philosophy. If we have the capacity to dig deep, ensuring that our digging is really a coherent, right? That it has logical structures that we're not gonna make too many mistakes because we can dig deep and make a ton of mistakes and our shovels break, you know, and then we're stuck. But part of the digging deep that's why we need each other collectively because I can start digging logically deep or have a nice theory of something, but I have maybe, maybe a major flaw. I need somebody else, right? Somebody to point to that flaw and, and help me out. Or I need somebody else to say, well, I mean, that's interesting, but you're leaving all these other perspectives of how else that logic could be implemented, for instance. So I, I, I feel, again, that it's a tricky answer because 
anybody else who's involved in that process. Could, could be an editor, right? It could be a, co- uh, a friend of Newton who said uh, to him, wait a second, uh, have you thought through this problem of time that you have, which he did, by the way, he had friends who pointed this out. He came out with universal time and space. And then somebody said, well, I don't know, your enemy overseas, uh, Leibniz had a good point saying that that's a problem. And Newton kept writing and thinking through and toward the end of his life, published another paper that's not well known in which he problematized. So that's um, somebody who does and can do because he had the potential to do it. But the fact that he did proceed and did keep working and it makes it that he was doing philosophy. So the potential is in all of us, but it takes the dedication to the process and working collectively uh, to ensure great depth and consistency. Now we've twisted around to our first question, you know, is one born a philosopher or does one become a philosopher, right? (laughs) You know, because potentially, you know, he had that in him potentially you said, um, but then it was triggered by something or some, some relationship with somebody. And so that leads us to this next question, you know, following up on Kim's, Kim's other two questions, what, what happens when we do philosophy? Is, is, you know, perhaps you can push a little bit further on this relationship of, you know, somebody digging deeply. Collectively. Yeah. Collectively, but somebody digging deep, deeply, but then another person checking are we, doing, are we doing philosophy right now? Are we, yeah, somebody, are, are we checking on each other to make sure we're doing something logically or correctly? Is, is that part of what it means to do philosophy, you know, to have that relationship with somebody? So there's somebody digging deeply, maybe that's not enough. Maybe you have to have the, the other person, another person, another person right, right. Ch- checking up or evaluating or exploring. Right. And yeah, that's that's a good uh, follow up question because even if you have intention of digging deeply with logical structures, it may be that is not necessarily philosophical. It's mostly presenting an account, right? I think philosophy entails that there's possibility of others engaging and checking the work, which is what's happened in the history of philosophy. You know, they're presenting these ideas that present views of the world, whether how we know the world, how we understand the basic structures of the world, and then others come in to challenge it or support it and challenge it, right? And then in that generation through the years has constituted the the philosophical core. And I think because nowadays, I think this question, putting it into context, nowadays this this question of, you know, um, who is a philosopher? If we not thin out what it means by... uh, all of a sudden, everybody is a philosopher, but rather saying who else can contribute to this conversation to ensure that not just a few of us are conversing with one another, with each other, like we're doing here, but really open it up. And of course, this TV show, hopefully, right? The, one of the purposes, maybe intentions, is that it opens up the possibilities. Is uh, I feel that what we need to do is really cultivate the grounds for ensuring that more folks enter into the conversation rather than a few. Uh, our problem, I think, right now in philosophy, maybe it's a different question, but is that too few enter these doors? And not to get into this other question, but I think even in academic circles, even at universities, sometimes philosophy departments get pushed into corners nowadays or they get extinct, uh, which is a great, uh, it's, too, it's a tragedy, really. But partly it's maybe because we're not doing some things right. For instance, logic. We want logic courses to be taught, but we teach in a very narrow way, in a way in which very few can enter. And some universities teach critical thinking courses, some others don't or don't allow it. And and even that there's a divide between true logic and then critical thinking, critical thinking for the masses, informal logic. But the truth is this, there's nothing informal about informal logic. And there's some severe problems with formal logic uh, internally, right? So I think if we were to open up these questions to people and they experience the logic in the everyday and they can help us shape what uh, this conversation could be, we can make more effective structures of, in fact, who gets to the philosophy, um, who gets to share this experience, who gets to help us collectively build it. 
and maybe anticipating a future question is that if we do this, we may be in better shape to do what a lot of times is the aim of philosophy, right? The aim of philosophy is to come up with just societies. And frankly, we have a lot of work to do. Where have we failed? Where we had incredible theories about justice, have they been transformed into applicable possible ways? I mean, who is informed of those theories? Who comes in with epistemic um, theories of knowledge that can help? We have a hard time creating those systems. Therefore, we're suffering because of it. So the idea of extending the collective is not, it is a philosophical project. What we're doing here is philosophy because if we're extending the reach, we're possibly transforming philosophy to much more accessible, but then at the same time, a deeper, richer, creating more opportunities for philosophers, in fact, which I think we're doing. Um, so I'll finish with that, but I do think that this is a philosophical act. It is mostly engaging in the experience and not the fact that you have the title or <laughs> that you're born one because you say so, but rather you have to be really engaged to create yourself into one. I, I heard you say that, um especially when, when you talked about justice, you know, like how, how's it going, you know, like your great theory, are you applying it? Is anything, you know, as James would say, you know, what's the cash value of, <laughs> show me the money, right? Of all your great thoughts. So are there different ways to do philosophy or is the application of, of the theory, the, the bottom line? I, I think the context and the experience helps shape um, differences within the philosophical journey. So for instance, some who are very attracted to the history of philosophy will obviously, depending on where that history happened, that they will find it in books and they will be very textually based and creating conversations and adding to the richness. There's incredible value there and so much work to be done. But that can be also, you know, and there's work done currently about new, Einstein as a philosopher, Isaac Newton as a philosopher, extending those nets and creating that richness. So that's, for instance, one example of an undervalued place in philosophy, even sometimes within philosophy, right? Even though partly what we do if we do professional philosophy is teach the history of philosophy. But interestingly enough, I think that there's great value there. But that's not the only way to do philosophy. Um, there's, But a similar but different way is to actually look at philosophy as a quest to engage folks who normally don't have access to philosophy, similarly the, ta the task of an introductory teacher of philosophy, but to have folks who get to see their narratives and having the potential, you know, to develop into something uh, deeper and rich, you know. And so maybe I say this because I'm part of the, I see myself more as part of this project, even though I'm very interested sometimes to dig into my books and, and look at the value of that. I see that very important differently. And similarly is if you dig into the actual experience of, of folks, and that's in El Paso, that collectively we can create similar type values based on actual experiences. The other one that I want to mention is based on experiences of philosophers from long ago or not so far long ago. And maybe one more example is, for instance, if somebody is invested nowadays in uh, anthropologically or working with a science, you know, working with physics to figure out current problems in, in the science as a way to uh, figure out how to, with the work of scientists, how to solve present problems. That's a different version of that. But I see it as doing philosophy. It's just contextually being looking very different and seemingly in the work produces very different, but it's, similar aim is trying to enrich the conversations, trying to enrich um, our understanding of the world and the problems that we face and hopefully solve them. Once by looking at the rich history of, of our ideas and how we can help us understand better ourselves and what happened on the road, maybe even current situations, the work, the scientists and philosophers working together maybe to, to solve some current problems and the ones working in community, sometimes they call maybe philosophy in action, but philosophy on the streets, whatever we want to call it, but also looking for ways to transform active current systemic problems in our communities and using philosophy to do so. I see it as the same philosophical journey or same philosophic journey rather. And 
Yeah, I mean, philosophic, I see it as a kind of ongoing, dynamic, more open. Philosophical seems more accomplished and more complete and more looking for a sense of completion. And who is right, who is wrong, who was defeated, you know, Plato defeated Aristotle or Aristotle defeated Plato. Philosophic is more like, well, there's a great value in Plato and there's great value in Aristotle. We need to appreciate, you know, those journeys. And in some respects, obviously find out that Aristotle did some things that Plato didn't, you know, create a logical structure that was applicable, you know, even though Plato had very good ideas about, you know, his method of division, you know, as a way to begin that journey. But so it's be able to really be more open and not get caught on, um, I, I, I would call it, you know, um, trivializing conversations that then see the benefit of remaining open to the possibilities. So that's the difference for me. Philosophic, it's open. Philosophical is a little more closed. We're already edging towards or perhaps engaged in some of these bigger questions we mentioned at the beginning of, uh, at the, beginning of the interview. And um, so here comes, you know, an obviously big question, one of those big philosophical questions, right? Uh, that, that perhaps is related to the combination of being philosophic and philosophical, right? So the question is, is one way of doing philosophy closer to the truth than others? So, or closer to reality, you know, truth or reality, right? So, and then, and then the related questions are what's, you know, what's true or what is the truth for you? And, and what, what's real or what is reality? Finally then, to wrap this or perhaps push it in a different direction, do you think there's a difference between reality and actuality? Hmm. That wow, that's a, how many hours we say we have? But this is it, you know, you talked about uh, opening up philosophy, opening up possibilities in life and, and helping communities become more engaged. And, but then you also began, almost began by talking about digging more deeply, right? And Hannah, Hannah mm -hmm. was a very famous philosopher from the 20th century, said, philosophers have to be comfortable with being alone with themselves. I mean, I labels can be helpful. This may be a helpful label here to be succinct, but I am fond of the school of pragmatism because of the idea that uh, truth is in the making, which has been ridiculed. I mean, Russell ridiculed James on it, and Dewey was um, also ridiculed for that, even in his um, development of his logic of inquiry process. But what to me, what it means is um, they can be very, very answers of what we assign truth to be, depending on the context. In the logical context, especially if it's a, a, a context of logic as propositions, propositions that are abstracted from the experience, well, truth was gonna have a particular look and then you can have truth tables and it works very nice, I'm very happy to use them. But there's a limited uh, context of validity, yeah, right? Or domain of validity because you know it's restricted to particular scope, right? That's, that's something that pragmatism say this, that has value, but it's not the only value, not the only way to talk about truth, right? And, and we do talk in many ways about truth and, and Philosopher's job is to try to tease out all these different contexts. But you put those together and what it is, the actual journey of philosophy, even today, we're still talking about the meaning of truth. Therefore, it is in the making <laughs> uh, from that history of analyzing philosophy. The other one is you go to a human being and tell them, oh, no, I got the truth. I got it. $20, you know, I'll give you the truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, that happens too. People will sell the truth, peddle the truth and go to this church or go to this, you know, read this book and you get the truth. I just don't know that's authentic. I think it's more authentic to say, you know, we can really inquire. And in that process, in the right context, for sure you can ask, is the answer to your question true? If I launch a, um, a rocket into space at this speed with these materials, will it disintegrate into space? Definitely in that context, we can find out what's going to work and what's not going to work. So truth is in the making. That's what it means. It's like we are in the process of figuring out what is true and we've figured many things out we've revealed a lot of things that we're reading in engineering and in science and, and in philosophy what works but also we still get yet a lot to figure out so that's the first thing i want to say on that secondly also as a pragmatist is that um 
it's important to recognize that as part of this journey of ascertaining what our thoughts are that we put into books, right? That we write ourselves, that we verbalize to each other, that there is an attempt to try to figure out our experience. Okay, that's why I started with experience because and Dewey was very good about this, wrote a whole book, you know, as experience, try to make education based on experience, try to make art based on experience, science clearly is based on experience. And he said, we need a theory of experience. Well, we still need a theory of experience. But what it means to me is that is the process of figuring out what our current situation is. What is the nature of reality? And then, yeah, you can make that different types of differentiation, the reality that I conceive, and I can write a book about, but there's the reality that is veiled from me. And then I can call it an actuality, maybe there somewhat hidden. Or I prefer to see ourselves in the process of digging, you know, of figuring out what that is, recognizing that my mental contraptions and the representations I may have, there's always going to be separated from the richness and the complexity of experience, but we can do a better and better job of representing what goes on. So I, I, I mean, I know a lot of scientists would say that, right? That's what science is about. It's not about giving you truth. It's about giving you a less error prone system, you know? So for me, that my answer will be uh, very on the pragmatist line. And I know there's subtle differences, you know, there were fights between <laughs> Peirce and James on this, even in the name pragmatism. Peirce was so mad at one point, he wanted to call it the name, call it pragmatism. But for me, ultimately they were in the same wavelength, which is we're in this journey in which we're trying to use the best of our semiotics, appealing to Peirce very quickly, in order to really come to terms with this experience. And if in the process I can ascertain something as being more truthful than something else, well, I've done some of good epistemology, right? And if in the process of really coming up with a clear understanding of what the experience is and that richness, which I can also model it and come up with a really poor understanding of it. So it's not like just anything goes. No, it's we need to give an opportunity to different approaches. Uh, James talks about in pragmatism about having this hotel and the different philosophical views are in this part of this hallway and this, this corridor. Well, let's make that happen. But knowing that as these ideas come together, we can find out that some of them are not as effective. Um, for instance, this idea that some of us are more privileged than others because of our, ra our race, you know? Well, clearly that doesn't have any scientific basis or effectiveness, but some of us still hold it and we'll go and try to defend it and storm the capital because of it. So some of these ideas can be very dangerous and we need to literally fight against them. So it's not like it's just anything goes, we need to open up, but then really get ourselves to work as we deepen it, you know, figure out collectively. And part of that collectiveness sometimes is to really fight against really erroneous views about science and what vaccines may do to us, for instance. So I'll stop there for now, but those are, like I said, those are a really powerful question. But, well, maybe one more thing. The other thing is I can have all these views and it's great. I can write a book about it and it will be great. And some of it may be repetitious since I'm a pragmatist. But my interest is actually maybe to do that. And I'm actually interested in doing that, putting a book together, but really to open up to the voices. So then collectively we can work over making sure that this digging happens most effectively without less error, with you know a, avoidance of terrifyingly bad ideas that you know put us into a, a hole that we don't want to be in, but rather put us into maybe digging is not the right image, but that helps us uh, get closer to a better understanding of our experiences as they evolve dynamically together. So I'll stop there. I, I, I should do the follow-up question too. <laughs> So well, okay. let me let me say a little bit something, just uh, like a totally off the side remark, yeah. and then follow up. All right. So in Mexico, in the, let me see, this is uh, at the end of the Porfiriato. Porfirio Diaz was the dictator for I don't remember how many years, right? But this is pre-Mexican Revolution, and the philosophy that they espoused was French positivism, and. Part of the way that they thought about it was, or rather the way that they justified the dictatorship was, well, look, I mean, who, who would you rather think the think up the laws? Um, 
all the people who are not educated, who are illiterate and don't know anything about science or law, jurisprudence, right? Or the experts, you know, the scientific experts who know and have studied and are prepared. Uh, the masses or the experts, scientific <laughs> right? right? Yeah, the group of scientific ones, right? So obviously, you know, so this is how they justified keeping um, the power just within a narrow, a narrow mm-hmm. scope. Um, but what you're arguing is the opposite. It's uh, yes. Well, and and not flipping in the way in which dethrone the scientists or the power of logic. Uh, no, and it is a fascinating example, right? Because then also not only what happened in Mexico, but it happened in the United States and, and the English speaking world when it comes to philosophy, which was different, you know, in France and in Germany, right? And it created these um, different schools, so-called in philosophy. But speaking of that example, I, I think that's perfect because the, the reversal is not that we disenfranchise science and just, you know, everybody just let's be illiterate together, but no, how we get everyone scientifically engaged, you know, not every, all of us will be scientists per se, but we can all improve in our science. I mean, become more literate, become more engaged and also be respectful of our experience. If it's an indigenous experience, it has to be respected. It has to be drawn from There's great value of it. There's great scientific um, ideas that might come from ancient practices that if we're not attentive to, we will miss out and we have missed out, right? And now pharmaceutical companies are going back to all these indigenous and trying to steal their secrets, you know? So, I mean, there's ways to do it that is really problematic and there's ways to do it that is really enriching. And in fact, if we don't do this sort of collective action, I know there's a dangerous term, but this collective art action based on philosophical inquiry where we engage each other in deep ways. I think, it's a big claim here, I think we'll always be failing to come up with structures and systems that are really effective. I think we're always gonna be failing in some fundamental way. Here, I said it. So I thought about this about 15 years ago and I thought, you know, we need to do something about it. Who's doing something about it? And I thought some people and I liked them and I read them, but then, <laughs> then I thought, well, I need to do something too. So, yeah. Well, Juan, you may have already answered <laughs> the question I was going to raise because um, I often teach my students, and I, and I hold this, I espouse this view myself, that all philosophy is personal. And so you've talked a lot about experience and understanding the experience that one's, one is going through. And so, you know, this comes back self-reflexively. You know, what am I going to do? You know, what's been my personal experience here, right? And so the question, the question is about your personal experience. So does this kind of personalize you as a philosopher, right? How do you philosophically understand the way that you relate systems thinking, creativity or art and aesthetics, and your practical collective engagement in the El Paso Juarez community? You know, how do, how do you bring all that together philosophically and personally? Okay, thank you. Well, I'll begin with something personal and I won't go into detail because maybe it's too embarrassing for me, but but I think the best asset I have is, you know, how often I felt philosophically. I mean, it started with when I was at Gonzaga and I was struggling with my English. I thought I wrote this paper on Khan that was brilliant and I think barely got a C, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, what happened? And and I, I never looked back, but I, I mean, obviously I did something wrong. Um, so I, I've always felt like, even though I was really into it, I was so behind the curve. And so my failures, I feel, have been very important as ways to help me ensure that they became transformational moments. I didn't see it at the time, but I think I've used, and I've got gotten better at it, right? So very pragmatist too, right? Minimization of error or find errors and then use that to transform. Mm-hmm. So... Um, with that in mind, one of the things that I wanted to do a few years ago was to create uh, systems, you know, uh, or at least start with uh, programs, small programs that maybe one day could become systematic or that had the goal of being systematic in which it could take uh, human beings and their personal being where they're at with their errors and use those as transformational moments. And we create a a few programs, uh, Dr. Diaz mentioned a few at the beginning in which that was the goal. 
And of course, once you get into the weeds, it's easy to say that, oh, we're going to create philosophical transformational programs and everybody's welcome. Okay, yeah, how are you, how are you going to do that? Well, I can tell you many failures in the process, but one, one of the programs that immediately took on was when we offer youth, and when I'm talking about fourth, fifth, sixth graders, an opportunity to engage deeply into these kinds of inquiries. And in fact, it was more based on scientific inquiry. Um, we had an idea of how to get them immediately into it, right? And these were youth and the first pilot program we happened in Canotillo who were seen as having lots of problems. They're not engaging in school. They're not the ones who will end up in college, you know, but we need to do something with them. Yeah, you want to take them for, us for a couple of months, see what happens. And what we found is that because we brought the artistic experience richly, you know, we brought uh, a graphic novel narrative. We also brought an opportunity to sort of take our time with music, really think through our experiences that we find appealing, that they found appealing. We create a really good space to open up that inquiry, to really stretch that philosophical grounds. And we ended up doing quite amazing work with them. I learned a ton from them, including that if you present youth with an opportunity to inquire openly and freely, they will take it. They will engage almost all of them. And I say almost because I don't want to say all because then, you know, but I, we were really amazed how impactful that was. So with that, we develop programs in which the arts kind of present itself as this opening up of the pores of our imagination, but really using Dewey, um, act as the focusing on our experience, the value of our personal, the personal me, me as an individual. I like this music and not this other one, you know, and I don't want somebody to tell me otherwise, right? Valuing where people are at, but recognizing that we can get better, all of us, you know? So this idea of including transformative practices, which the arts also help, not only focus on the experiences I have, but help it turn into an experience. Louis says, we all have experiences, but an experience is maybe the beginning of the aesthetic journey, right? And that's not, he's not the only one that's done this. You know, Benjamin, you know, mm -hmm. did very similar things with his concept of the aesthetic. So without getting into the philosophical weeds of that, for us was using the arts in order to engender powerful connection and buy-in we can use that to really dig deeply into the scientific inquiry and philosophic inquiry. And we had the youth at the end of two months talk about relativity and explain to their parents how a moving clock in a moving train slows down in relation to a stationary observer. And the parents were like, what are you doing to my kids? What are they talking about? But they, so we saw great possibilities. And then we use that and the errors that we did, because we could have done some things better, as transformational opportunities for us, which then it got us in front uh, one day of a federal judge with great vision, uh, Judge Frank Montalvo, to provide a similar type concept for um, those who have experienced federal prison, because they were facing a program of reentry that was new, that it was not operating, you know, uh, ideally and we accepted, all of us accepted to work together systemically to see if we could create something. And we created Shadows to Light, which later on we had uh, the addition of marvelous philosopher to join us, Dr. Diaz, I think you might have heard of her. But the idea was to build something transformational, but really curated. And what we've seen is people, not all of them, but maybe, but a good number of them will take this act of transformation. If they listen long enough, you're able to connect with them long enough. It's been really powerfully tra transformative. So is taking this idea of philosophy as transformational and actually make it so, but not in a vague sense of, oh, well, we provide people opportunity to sort of have good conversations and, and just that. No, really, is we really do read philosophic texts. We do read literature. And then we enter into philosophical questions based on the literature, the art experience. So really offering, uh, some people call it higher learning, that the type of learning that we, we see in college, you know, and college level, bring it so it gets to experience by many. So then collectively, we can begin to build 
a more fair system of justice. One in which, and I'll finish with this part, right? One in which, because of our successes, allowed a program called Adelante, which offers instead of federal prison, an opportunity to do philosophy. And I always joke, you know, I make this joke that maybe it's a worse fate for them to be in this program than actually go to prison. But anyway, they get to do philosophy and the arts and sure. literature with that. But it, it's yeah. Yeah. little do they know they're entering into a, a long term. Yes. A long term. Little did you know? Disciplinary practice, just a way different kind of discipline, right? I would like what a to, wonderful answer. Yeah, that was a great answer. I would like to go back to something you mentioned. And also a lesser known fact about you is that you, uh, when you first came to the U.S. from from Catalonia, you lived in a reservation. You made a reference to American Indians and their knowledge and how the scientific community now is finally acknowledging some of their advances, right? That the traditional ways that were disregarded as unscientific. So I'm just wondering if you could share more about your experience living in an American Indian reservation. Where was this, when, um, and how did living with, with American Indians change your worldview? Yeah, how was it transformational, so to speak? Yes, uh, great question. Uh, and, and I'll be specific. I actually lived at the edge of the Spokane Indian Reservation. I was not quite in the Indian Reservation, but part of the property was uh, that I was in. And I lived with a family that was not from the Spokane Indian group, but most of my friends at the high school I went were. So it was really an in-between set of spaces. And But my, my experiences uh, were that uh, my naive concept was to be an indigenous American was from Western movies, <laughs> very poor. And it was shocking to me to be so ignorant. So for me, it was transformation because I saw that, that what in my head, the truth about being indigenous American had nothing to do with the reality of it. And some of it was not, I mean, there was alcoholism at that reservation. There still is, but there was also incredible powerful practices at the powwows or in the ways of thinking and talking about the world and how loving some of those families were. I almost feel like, you know, very willing to take me in, even though I had no idea what was going on. I could barely speak the language. So it felt very loving. It felt very powerful, very much a place where I wanted to learn how, what the magic was about that. Because even in the family I was living with, maybe it didn't feel fully like that definitely was not like uh, all the experiences I had. So it was definitely transformational in that way. And at the time I didn't know it, it took me some time to reflect back. But after a few years, then it led me to the exposure of more indigenous uh, concepts and ideas to the point it really I got, when I was at uh, uh, UTEP for many years, I spent quite a bit of time learning, really becoming a learner of Maya thought and culture and the philosophy of it. And I, my thinking became empowered by that. So I, I really, it's been transformation on many levels, personal, intellectual, and definitely philosophic, philosophical. Yeah. Before we ask this last question, if, 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 if we have time, do you have questions for us? Well, I would love to know um, what your vision is, uh, let's say after a few philosophers or philosophically, philosophically inclined individuals come and join your program, what is your vision for these conversations? What is your what is your hope? I can I can start. Uh, for me, is to have fun to keep learning, because um, when I started doing philosophy, it was fun, you know. And then you get real serious because you get professional, <laughs> and it's almost like the fun is taken out. But um, but it's just been always very. Um, yeah, much like little kids, you know, it's just, wow, this stuff is really interesting. <laughs> and uh, I would like to share that with our viewers. For, and for me, um, an extension of what we're doing today, I, th I think this is fun, what we're doing today, but I think it's also a learning experience um, and uh, a demonstration to others and with others uh, of how philosophy um, 
can be accessible, how it, how it, how it, it helps change people's lives um, and enriches people's lives, you know, by mm -hmm. the way that it's enriched ours. And it brings us into peculiar kinds of conversations, mm. <laughs> talking about truth, the relationship of art to beauty, to justice. Um, these are all peculiar sorts of issues and questions that entail a lot of digging deeply, but also entail a lot of collective thinking as you put it on. Maybe my concept of fun needs to be questioned, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't I'm so not maybe, sure. Maybe a little warped. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think having fun is, is, is really at the heart of it. I, I talk about having enjoyment, you know, so I'm, I'm developing my own um, philosophical eth ethical theory based on phenomenology. But at the, at the heart of it is enjoyment, right? So if we're not enjoying ourselves, right, then we're not growing, you know, we're not relating in, in good, helpful, healthy ways. So, and I, and I want us to enjoy ourselves, to enjoy ourselves with you, for you to enjoy yourselves with us, uh, yourself with us, and, and, ho and hopefully our audience will enjoy these conversations. Yeah, I hope so. The, the audience uh, watching this will have enjoyed themselves. I for sure have enjoyed the conversation. I know I, I talked a lot, but um, you asked very good questions. I couldn't help myself. But yes, I think the concept of enjoyment, fun, is also very important because for me, I don't think I've ever lost it. I, I think even being challenged or being having difficult moments, um, I never stopped feeling that I was in my philosophical journey, so. I would like to uh, start to wrap this up, but before I start to wrap it up, it's hard to get philosophers to stop talking. Um, <laughs> it's true. Well, some of the questions that we would like to continue to ask Dr. Ferret in case he could honor us in the future are, what is deviance? And is deviance a bad thing um, to begin with, right? Because um, I think that's an interesting, those are interesting questions. Is, is being a deviant a bad thing? Um, also, he works a lot with logic. So we wanted to ask him a little bit more about his logic system that he's been developing. His logic system pays more attention to the boundaries than to the fixed categories, which traditional logic does, but more attention to the categories. So, and I wanted to ask him about how his logic that he's been developing is related to being in La Frontera. So those are questions that maybe we can ask um, at a future time. But for now, Sounds great. Um, but it, where can, in case our viewers have questions for you or would like to get in touch with you, what would be the best way to, for them to get in touch with you? Probably the best way would be through my email, um, which I can mention uh, is jferret at bsicommunity.org. Um, we call it SI, you know, but it's, Philosophic Systems Institute of PSI community.org. Jay Ferret, send me an email if you have any, any questions you want to know more. And uh, we have a website that is in development, should be available soon. And it should be sci-community.org. You can also find out there, but give us, give us a little bit, it's still being refreshed. So by, me, by the time you hear this, maybe we'll be, be ready to go. Sci-community.org. Dr. Fred, this has been wonderful. Thank, thank you for being thank our first. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for being <laughs> our first guest. We very much appreciate your time and, and openness. And um, thank you and both. All of, all of the words that you've shared with us. Well, thank you both. It's been fun for me, truly. And yeah, I only wish we had another four or five hours to, uh, <laughs> to address all the good points and questions that you were bringing up. And also for me to hear from you. And uh, thank you for the audience for listening in and tuning in. And I look forward to listening and watching uh, more of the show in the future. Thank you. Hasta luego. Bye. Take care, everyone. Thank uh, Dr. Ferret in, in absentia for joining us. We're thankful that he was our first guest and that we could enjoy having a conversation <laughs> with him. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, and with each other. Right. Yeah. <laughs> My name again is Dr. Kim Diaz. I teach philosophy at El Paso Community College. My email, you can contact me if you have any questions 
for suggestions for future topics for the show, you can find me at kdiazkds60 at epcc.edu. And my email address is jsimon, J-S-I-M-O-N, at utech.edu. We'd like to share with you some of the coming attractions. For our first season, we are exploring philosophically the name of our show. Our show is titled Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera. And so we're exploring what does it mean? What is philosophy, right? What is philosophy? And what does it mean to be in dialogue with others? And perhaps just as important, maybe even more important, what does it mean to be in dialogue with each other philosophically from La Frontera? What is the border? You know, how do we do philosophy at the border? Are there borders in philosophy? You know, is, is, is the, the frontera something to be, you know, extended, explored? Um, it's a dynamic place here, here in El Paso, El Paso Juarez. It's not just El Paso, right? It's El Paso Juarez. We're on a, a border between two cities, a border between two nations, uh, and a border between two cultures and perhaps two different ways of practicing philosophy. So those are kinds of questions that we'll raise with each other and uh, with our audience and with our guests. So please join us so we can continue asking the big questions together.